Thanks, Jim. It's a great pleasure and uh, blessing and privilege to be with you uh, tonight. And um, we're near neighbours, church-wise as well. And I do want to say uh, very importantly that uh, we do appreciate your prayers. I know you do pray for us down the road, and we certainly do do need it. Mm -hmm. uh, so thanks for those prayers um, and um, your your support. Uh, Jim's been a great support to me since I took the post down at uh, Gangad. So and we are probably the nearest neighbour to you, so uh, it's good for us to, to have fellowship together, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to speaking and ministering to you tonight. Can we just begin with a word of prayer, if that's okay, and then Amen. we can get started. Father, we just thank you for this time together, this fellowship sweet Lord. We pray, Lord, that that will be, uh, Lord, this beginning of a great relationship between ourselves and mm. the folks here, Father. Lord, we also ask tonight your anointing be in all that's said and done and it be for the glory of your kingdom, Lord. Lord, we don't want to see anybody glorified here but Jesus. Lord, I thank you that your name has been lifted up and exalted this night. And may it continue to be in this message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we turn to Habakkuk chapter 2, folks, if we can? I've not found it difficult to prepare for tonight's uh, meeting message-wise for the simple reason that I've been sharing this quite a bit uh, in different places that have been preaching lately, um, all over the, the country, and um, well, it's been it's been a good blessing to folks, and it's certainly blessed me, so I'm hoping tonight that it'll bless you. So Habakkuk chapter 2, it's page 1341, if you're struggling to find the page, it's 1341 in my Bible. Okay, so Habakkuk chapter 2, and it's a, a familiar passage to us. And just and it's a great introduction to what I believe God wants us to look at tonight. So we begin from verse verse two. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Write the vision and make it plain. That he may run who reads it. So the vision that God wants to give is a vision for us to run with. God gives vision so that we have something to run with. Something to, as Jim was saying, with the, the, the wee uh, mission thing. Something to run with, something to carry, something to take with us as we go forward in the Lord. And I want to speak tonight about a vision or visions that I had, believe it or not, as a teenager. And the Lord's been bringing this back to me a long time. And that, I know that you might think that wasn't that long ago, <laughs> you know, just a few years back. But I can assure you um, that it was. And, you know, sometimes God gives us things when we're young in the faith. And he'll give us visions, he'll give us dreams, he'll give us things that really inspire us. But as we go on in life, sometimes we look back at what God's given us, and particularly if it's not been fulfilled, particularly if it's never come to pass. And this vision, or the visions that I want to talk to you about tonight, have not come to pass, as my, as my kids would say, uh, in true life, as they call it. They've not come to, they're not manifest, they're just still in that vision form. Uh, but visions should excite us. Without a vision, the people perish. So if you don't have vision, you need to get vision. And let me say this, if you don't have visions that God has given you, well, this book's full of them. And the visions that I had are biblical visions. So and it, you, we can get all, there's people that get all kinds of visions. And we don't want to follow them if, if it's, we can't find it here. Amen? Or it doesn't come from the Lord. So vision is important. But sometimes I said... When we're young in the faith and we get and we get visions or, or we hear things, we get we get all excited. But then when we get a wee bit older and we kind of settle down a wee bit, we get great visions. But we settle down and we, we, we maybe start thinking, you know, the Lord just gave me that to encourage me. He just gave me that to sort of a, a spur me on. But I might never see that in my lifetime. Well, we can all get into that way of thinking at times. Let me tell you something this. I believe this. If God has given us visions, then we need to apprehend those visions and run with them. And also 
Uh, they talk in leadership courses, don't they, about casting your vision. Well, I'm casting vision tonight. I'm throwing it out there. But believe you me, I will, I will back it up for the word of God. So what were the visions that I saw? I'll, I'll, I'll explain that very, very quickly. When I was, all my life as a, as a wee boy, I felt God's hand on me. And um, I had Christian relatives who I knew, I know, prayed for me. And I always felt God's hand on me. But when I became a teenager, I got seriously interested in the things of God. And I used to go up the stairs to my room and I'd lie in my bed. Sometimes I'd be sleeping, but not always. And I would just see, night after night, visions. And the visions that I saw, in one word, multitudes. Multitudes of people. So I can see it very clear, I can still see it now what I saw. Different visions of multitudes, uh, d d different things going on. But I could see that I could see the people, I could see I can still see it today. It was like a, a panoramic camera going over them. Multitudes and multitudes of people coming into the kingdom of God. Amen. Multitudes. <coughs> and that word is now branded in my heart. Now the Lord sort of made me revisit this in recent times, okay? Um, as I said, you go on, you, you, you get involved in all kinds of stuff in the Christian life, in ministry, you have different things that you're involved in. But the Lord's been bringing this back to my, my thinking quite a lot lately, and I've been preaching it in many, many places, um, several places. Visions of multitudes. And you know, that's a Bible vision. I'm going to show you that right now. In fact... What's really exciting is you've got it on your wall. Yeah. The harvest. Yeah. The harvest. Yeah. Multitudes come. And that's a vision. And that's what I want to speak about tonight. It's a simple one. It's not a complex one. If our vision's too complex at times, you know, it, we've made it complicated. The, vision's, the vision is simple. It's multitudes coming into the kingdom of God. Yeah. And, and I would say this. You have to have this vision. Yeah. You have to have this vision. Because if you don't have this vision, let me ask the simple question, what are we doing here? Are we happy just to have, you know, the church quite full, our church full, you know, we're happy to have enough folks to have a good meeting, or do we want the multitudes? Amen. We've Gam Gad, Springburn, are both built up areas, aren't they? Loads of folks out there, multitudes out there tonight, that don't know Jesus, that don't know our Saviour, that don't know What's going on in here? And don't care, some of them. Some might be curious, but every single one of them is trying to fill that God-shaped vacuum in their heart, that hole in their inner being with drugs, drink, sex, entertainment, football, idols. We talk about football clubs, idols. So they're trying to fill that hole in their heart. Multitudes of people, because every single person has that hole. We had it, thankfully we found the one thing that can fill that, which is the presence of God. So we have to have this vision, and we have to have a multiplication mentality. Having this vision of multitudes is very, very biblical, and we'll look at that um, as quickly as we possibly can. Genesis chapter 15, a little bit of scripture to rattle through, but that's the vision, so... Um, and I'm making it plain, and so I want to give this to you as something for us all to run with. You guys here in Springburn, us down there, but all of us really, when you say, we, we, we talk about uh, multitudes, the, the First Timothy chapter 2 says, pray for all men everywhere. If God doesn't want us to have a parochial vision, just our wee family, our wee bunch, our wee circle of influence, he says the first priority of prayer is pray for all men everywhere. In other words, get the global vision, get God's vision for planet Earth, and then you know you can fill in all the, 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 the details. But have that big vision, the big vision being multitudes. Jim spoke about uh, the, the, the revival, the great end time thing that's, that's coming. Okay, so Genesis chapter 15, and it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Abraham wanted a baby. That was his vision. His vision that consumed him 
was to have an heir and not have to leave everything to his butler. Okay? He wanted a boy of his own. He wanted a boy bouncing on his knee. He just wanted to be a daddy. That was his vision. I just want to be a daddy. My name means daddy. That's his name meant father. Or high father. And, and he wanted to live up to his name. His vision was to live up to his name. And so he said, What's, what will you give me? It's not wrong to say that to the Lord. What will you give me, Lord? Because the Bible says he that comes, he must believe that God is and that he's a rewarder. Do you know that God's a rewarder? Mm -hmm. He wants to answer prayers. He wants to answer the desires of your heart. And he wants to give you a vision and a burning heart for that vision and then fulfill that vision. So God had placed this desire for a baby in Abram's heart. But look at this. It says, then Abram said, look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. He's saying the same thing over and over. I don't have somebody to leave all this stuff to, that you've blessed me with. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. <coughs> and here's what God's saying is, I'm going to answer your, I'm going to reward you by fulfilling your vision. I'm going to answer you, Abram. And I'm going to give you what you, your heart's desire. But look what the Lord said to him next. Your vision, though, there's a problem with it. It's way too small. And we can't afford to go before the God of heaven and earth, brothers and sisters, with a small, narrow vision. God wants our vision to be in line with his vision. Amen? I don't want Bill McMurdo's vision for Scotland, for the Garn Gad, for, for, for Britain, for the move of God. I want God's vision. And this is what God was trying to get Abraham pushing him into. Saying, meeting your need is nothing to me. But I need you to align yourself with me. Because look what he said next. He said, he brought him outside. Sometimes we have to go outside of where we are. Sometimes we have to get out of our comfort zone. Because in our comfort zone, we, 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 we develop small visions. Narrow visions. Almost to a point where we say, well, you know, I could actually help the Lord here. I could help him out here and get what I want. But when it's only God that can do it, that's what God wants. Amen? Yeah. Because if our testimony is, the Lord helped me, and I helped him a wee bit, that's not a testimony. But when it's God, God alone, that's a testimony. So he said, he brought him outside, and he said, look now toward heaven. In order... To, to get a vision that, that's in line with what God wants, we have to look toward heaven. Looking toward the earth won't fulfill the vision that God has for us. Look now toward heaven. Then he says, and count the stars if you're able to number them. An impossible task. A God-given vision is impossible for man to fulfill in the natural. Amen? You can't fulfill God's vision and by natural means. He didn't have a calculator, but even if he did, he'd have, he, he, he just wouldn't have worked. It's man's impossibility is when we reach the end of what's possible for us, that's when we begin to enter into the realm and the zone that God wants to take us into. So he says, count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. See, Abraham, or Abram, you want a baby. I'm going to give you a baby. But I want multitudes. I'll, the baby's fine. We'll do that. But through the baby there'll be multitudes. And God always has multitudes on his mind. And the Abrahamic covenant, the blessing of Abraham, only multitudes could fulfill it. Can you count the grains of sand? Can you count the stars? No. Because I want multitudes. An uncountable multitude. I was watching Lester Sumrall the other day, um, and just before I was, and I, I was preaching somewhere, and I preached this, and Lester Sumrall said Smith Wigglesworth <coughs> was talking about the end time revival, and he says it'll be a multitude that no man can count, and again that's biblical, a multitude that no one will be able to count, that's what God has on his heart, and if it's in God's heart, it needs to be in our heart. 
if it's God's vision, it needs to be our vision. Amen. So he says, he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the law, it says, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Abraham's belief in God for multitudes was accounted to him for righteousness. Amen. So anyway, Genesis chapter 17, we'll go there next. And God's, God's on this theme. Abram's God's servant, he's his covenant partner in the earth. And the thing that God keeps speaking to Abram about is what we're speaking about tonight. Multitudes. Seed. Countless seed. Uncountable. He says, when Abram was 99 years old, now remember Abram, Abram's problem is that he has a wife Abram's past the, the, the ability to have children's too old. Abram's wife has been barren all her days. Plus she's been through the menopause. So his situation as the years go by become more and more impossible in the natural. You know, it's not difficult. It's not a, a challenge. It's not his issues. It's impossible. You know, sometimes we have to go through situations that seem impossible before we're going to see the move of God that's coming. You know, right now we might say, well, what about all these churches that are closing? What about all the, the churches that are dwindling in attendance? What about the loss of influence? We're praying through there in the prayer room about the state of the nation. I'm sure Christians all over Britain are praying tonight about the state of things because it just seems to be dark and gloomy. And sometimes it, it's going to look impossible. Because God has multitudes in his heart. And to bring those multitudes through, we, we, we're going to have to go through things. And, and we're maybe just going through the beginning of things just now, because what did the Lord say? He said, I will shake all nations. And what we're going through, we think, oh, what's happening here? We, we don't understand this. But the Lord's told us, he's going to shake all nations. We're going through a shaking. We might go through a whole lot more shaking. A whole lot of shaking going on. <laughs> for those of you who are Jerry Lee fans <laughs> but it's true and, and you know we get upset I get upset I, and we get, we get a little bit fretted and we get a little bit Lord what's happening well what's happening is he's shaking the nations and he's shaking this nation and why is he shaking the nations for one purpose because there's a harvest coming yeah, God. that's the reason why we're being shaken because God's saying I have to make room for this harvest and so I have to shake things up Okay, if you want to do things in, in your house, you have to sh do a bit of shaking up, don't you? And move stuff around, get move the furniture around, clean stuff out, get rid of some people maybe. <laughs> Amen? Uh, but anyway, so anyway, so he says here, Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. God has multiplication on his heart. God is a multiplier. Okay, he's not a divider, he's a multiplier. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. And in the, the, the margin it says, a multitude of nations. It's not even just a multitude of people, it's a multitude of nations. So he's saying that, I'm going to, it's exponential multiplication, Abraham. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. And Hebrew scholars will tell you that the additional H is a shortened version, really, of their divine name. So he's put God's name, he's put his name in the middle of Abraham's name. And here's the thing. If you're going to see multitudes come into the kingdom of God, you need God's name. Don't you? Because you're not going to do it in your name. Or the name of your church. Or your denomination. It has to be God. And so he put this right in the middle of Abram's name. Because there had to be that shift in Abram. And the, the name change really meant that Abram went from being high father to father of many nations. In other words, God said, I have to put multiplication in your name. I have to put that element in your name. So that you will be a father of multitudes. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, 
and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. So he's continuing to speak to him about multiplication. All right. Now we can go on looking at Abraham um, and and all that, um, and looking at how God multiplied them, and then of course uh, Isaac and Jacob. They had that same thing on their mind that they were told there would be, you know, many nations would come from them and so on. So multiplication is in the DNA of, of Abraham, of the people of God, and it's certainly right there in the Abrahamic blessing and covenant. In fact, you could say the blessing of Abraham is multiplication. Remember Moses said to the children of Israel, the Lord make you a thousand times more. You and your children. That DNA of multiplication was built in to the, the seed of Israelite people. And when you think about it, I mentioned experiential multiplication. Imagine every person in this room, that if I was to speak that same blessing on you, and you went out and got a thousand people to come to the Lord. So that every one of you is multiplied a thousandfold. I'm not counting, but that's going to be a lot, you know, tens and tens of thousands of people. But exponential multiplication is if every one of the thousand that each of us got also got a thousand and then they got a thousand. That's exponential multiplication. That's how all these multi-level marketing firms, you know, the, the Herbalife and all, Amway and all these things, that's how they, they, their marketing plan goes so that they just keep multiplying. Where do you think they got that idea from? From the Lord, from this book, because that's how God, that's the plan. And that's why the early days of the church and revival, we see that kind of multiplication going on. Because Christianity was always meant to be viral. Always meant to be a viral movement. But what happens is sometimes when it stops being viral, which means it spreads, just like the flu spreads or other viruses spread, and become an epidemic is that we contain the epidemic, don't we? In some churches. That's how we do it. We, 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 we contain the epidemic so it doesn't go outside the walls. But it's designed to go outside the walls. And that's why we need to get that vision and become infected with the Holy Ghost virus and go out there and infect as many people as we can. Amen? So that's how we need to think about it. So just a couple of things. Let's go into the New Testament. But Jesus said that I think are so important for us to look at. John chapter 4. And it's an interesting one because here's Jesus. This is an amazing passage. Jesus goes to a well looking for something to drink. The disciples go off looking for something to eat. And Jesus meets a woman. And let's just say it's not a woman that you would necessarily invite to church. Well, you may invite her to church. But how many people would have this woman pick her to start a revival? He has this conversation with this woman. And she's not even, you know, she's not a, 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 an Israelite in, the, in the, the, the full... She's a Samaritan. So they have different ideas of worship. So you see, well, first of all, she's quite a loose woman. To, 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 to use a phrase. She's been married five times. She's loved me a man that isn't her husband. And she's got a wonky idea about God. She's, you know, probably, we would say she's, she's into a cult or something. So that's the last woman on earth that you say, we'll pick this woman to reap a harvest. But Jesus picks her. Because God doesn't look on their appearance. And here's the other thing, he doesn't look in your past. He looks in the heart. And this woman is there and Jesus isn't interested in her past. He's not interested in her present. He's not interested in her wacky ideas about worship and that she goes to the wrong church. He's interested in the hunger that's in her heart to fill that void, that God-shaped void. And he begins to speak to her. And, and, what, and what, what, look what it says here. We're not going to get into what he, what he goes on about to the, the woman at the well. That's another thing. But look what happens after it. When after it, he says, he reveals that he's the, the Messiah to her. He's the Christ. And then, of course, she then goes off later on. starts a revival. 
in the nearby town. Who would pick a woman like that to, be, to start a revival? Well, Jesus did. Amen. But look what he says to the disciples. At this point, verse 27, John chapter 4, verse 27. At this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Okay? They marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? The women then left their water pot, went away into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Okay? But look what they said. The disciples said to one another, and they, made, they urged them, Rabbi, eat, have some to eat. Jesus, you, you need some to eat here. Which is fine. Then he said to them, verse 32, I have food to eat of which you do not know. I have food to eat of which you do not know. I'm nourished by things that you're not aware of. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Because that's natural thinking, isn't it? That's natural ideas, natural thinking. Nat natural thinking will not bring in the, mu the multitudes. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. My food, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God. The will of God is what's important here. And what is the will of God? He then tells them what the will of God is. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? That's natural thinking, isn't it? And in the natural, if it's four months to harvest time, there's not going to be a harvest of crops, is there? Because it's not ready. But what he's saying here is, he's not talking about a natural harvest, he's talking about multitudes and the harvest that God wants to reap. And what he's saying, to, and, and we still see it today, we all, we're all guilty of it. Well, people aren't interested in our message. You heard that one? I've tried to tell people about Jesus, but they're not interested. This generation doesn't want to know the Lord. We're all guilty of saying things like that, aren't we? Uh, hearts are hard, and people have got stony hearts, and, and well, did the Bible says there's going to be a great falling away in the end? Well, we know there's going to be a great falling away. That's the challenge, not the full stop, isn't it? The harvest is still to come. But we put off the harvest because what do we say? Well, one day. <clears throat> we know it's coming one day. And really what he's saying is, that's just like saying there's yet four months to harvest. It's coming one day, but today is not that day. But then look what Jesus says. Do you not say there are still four months, then comes the harvest? In other words, the harvest is future. And that's often our thinking, isn't it? Well, it'll happen one day. I might not be around to see it, but it'll happen. We've had so many prophecies, but... But look what he says. Behold, I say to you, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. For they are already white for harvest. If you have people who don't have Jesus in their heart and in their lives, that's harvest. And the challenge is not, well, Lord, we know that one day it's going to happen. The challenge for us is to get before God, co-labor with him, and be in position to reap that harvest. Isn't it? Because people... You know, the old people need the Lord. People need Jesus. And it doesn't matter, it, it does, it, you know, Jesus is saying here, that the harvest, is there anybody out there who doesn't know me? And in Springburn, there are tens of thousands. Between Springburn and Gamgad and, and this whole part of the, the city, hundreds of thousands. You know, certainly many tens of thousands. And that's the harvest. And he says, don't put the harvest off. Understand the fields are white for harvest. And you're the harvesters. We're the harvesters. Why else are we here? 
He says the fields are white for harvest, and he, and then he goes on and says he will reap, receives wages, and so on. And then that there's no reason to point and, and return and take my Bible because there it's there. In fact, let's just do that because it doesn't say the whole thing, and I want to. So if you've got your Bibles, Matthew chapter nine, and we can put these two these two passages together to see that Jesus has multitudes on his mind. Jesus has harvest on his mind. Jesus is saying, behold, look, lift up your eyes. Abraham had to lift up his eyes. Didn't he? To see the multitudes. And Jesus is saying, if you want to see the multitudes, if you want to see harvest, you need to lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes from church. Lift up your eyes from all the the good activities. And it's not wrong to be involved in church. It's not wrong to be uh, involved in exciting things and, and so on. What I was excited about in speaking to Jim and seeing your program, you've you've got that here. You've got the, the if you want to call it the unsaved on your heart here. Reaching out. A lot of churches don't. It's all about conferences and seminars and how to be a better Christian, how to pray more and how to be more effective, but all in church. All contained in the four walls of church. And it's very easy to get that way. It's very easy to become a preacher who just preaches to the converted. Rather than saying, Lord, I, I want, I've got multitudes in my heart. I've got revival in my heart. I want to see it. And I'm not, I will not rest until I see it. God, I believe, is looking for leaders and Christians with that in their heart. So here it says, Matthew chapter 9. He said to his disciples, this is the key thing, the harvest truly is plentiful. In other words, the the harvest is massive. The harvest, the potential is huge. The upside is uncountable multitudes. So what's the problem then? The labourers are few. I I find that astounding even today reading that. Because... There are millions of Christians. But he's saying the labourers are few. In other words, what he's saying is we don't have enough. The the problem isn't a lack of harvest. We don't have enough reapers. We don't have enough people who reap. And in order to reap a harvest, you'll not do it sitting in your living room. You'll not do it planning to do it. You'll not do it thinking about doing it. And you'll not even do it praying about doing it. In order to reap a harvest, you have to get out in the fields with your sickle and start reaping. Reaping takes action. Reaping takes reapers. God is looking for reapers. He says, therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. Now, just as we draw this to a close, just want to say a few things. And, and, and Joel, there's a, the, I know it's not necessarily speaking about um, our situation, but it's a quite a good. Um, it, it's quite a good uh, analogy for what we're talking about, and it speaks to our time. It speaks to our national situation. It speaks to what's going on in the nations. It speaks to what we're encountering right now. How many believe that we're in momentous times, end times, we're in an exciting part of history where we're going to see great and mighty things, including the Lord's return, amen? So we're right there on the cusp of these things. We're right there in the heart. The things that I saw as a teenager, I've not seen those multitudes coming. And it wasn't just God encouraged me to to make me, you know, go to church. He was showing me things that were yet for an appointed time. And I'm sure all of us had, have had similar visions or, or, or have heard things and it's burning in our heart. That appointed time, when we're going to see that great end time move of God. Okay? And here it says in Joel chapter 3, Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the wine press is full, the vats overflow, their wickedness is great. What he's saying is the harvest is there. Put in the sickle. Let's get reaping.
okay? Let's reap the harvest that's there. Then he says, multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near. In the valley of decision. That's where we are as a nation tonight. As a nation, we've had the independent, well, here in Scotland, we've had the independence referendum, haven't we? Multitudes in the valley of decision. Independence or union. We've had Brexit. Sorry for mentioning it. <laughs> did you think you were going to have a Brexit free night? Sorry to disappoint. Brexit. Remain or leave? Stay in Babylon or leave Babylon? Multitudes in the valley of decision. But you know the greatest decision that people have to make is not just decisions of independence or union or do we stay in Europe or the EU, do we come out? The decision that really people must make in this nation is are they going to receive Jesus as Lord and Saviour or are they not? And that's it. And you know, the, that decision is not something that, that they can escape. But I believe God wants to raise up a people who say that decision is what many mil multitudes are avoiding. But he wants labourers to go to those folks and say, that's a decision you need to make. And come and join God's people on the victory side. Come and join the body of Christ. Come and join the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is advancing. And if you, if you don't, you'll be left behind. That's the decision. Multitudes in the valley of decision. But it takes, it takes labourers and it takes people who say, Lord, I'm answering, I'm, I see that vision and I want to be part of that. So that's really what I have to share with you tonight. Um, it's that simple. The will of God is harvest. The work of God is harvest. What are you seeing? What is your vision? Are we seeing what Jesus said to see? The field's white. The harvest is there. Or are we, are we seeing a vision of our own choosing? Or the, the thing that, that the devil would want us to see which is, ah, people aren't interested in all that Christian stuff anymore. What we've got. Uh, we'll just be the remnant. It's, it's good to be the remnant. But the remnant is there for a purpose, which is to pray for the multitudes and bring them in and reap the harvest. So if we're a remnant people, and we are, let's be honest, we're a small minority. But God's saying, pray the, pray, pray, the Lord of hosts has a remnant. And that remnant has a purpose, and the purpose is to say, Lord, it's time for the multitudes to come in. So, brothers and sisters, get your combine harvesters right. Amen. Amen. You don't even have to do it anymore. We just, you know, lack of technology. We're in the information age. We can do it. We've got all kinds of tools to do it. Not just uh, literature, but we've got internet. We've got everything. We've never had more technology to reach the masses and to bring in the multitudes. So let's commit ourselves. If you don't mind, I'm going to lead you in prayer. And um, I'm going to commit us all tonight to responding to this call, I believe, for all of us to become uh, harvesters and bring in the multitudes. Father, we just thank you tonight for this you. word, Lord. It's not my word, it's your word uh, about, Lord, multitudes. And I believe you've got multitudes in your heart. You want to see thank multitudes you. in Springburn. You want to see multitudes in Royston. You want to see multitudes throughout this city. That, Father, once again we would have a holy city here in Glasgow where the, the, go the gospel is preached, your name is praised, Father, and that, Lord, you're glorified throughout the earth from this city and from this country of Scotland and this nation of Britain. Father, we ask right now that you would help every one of us, call us, Lord, and choose us to be harvesters in the great harvest to come. That, Lord, it isn't even to come, it's now. So, Lord, we enter into that, we respond and ask, Lord, that you'd make us reapers yes. of this harvest in Jesus' holy name. And if you're here tonight, you don't know the Lord, you're not a Christian, it's as simple as saying, Lord, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Saviour. Forgive me of my sins. I believe that you died for me and that God raised you. It's as simple as doing that, friend. You can do that right now. You can do that when you get home. But ask Jesus to come in and be your Lord and Saviour. And you will 
be part of the harvest, and then you will be yourself a reaper and harvester of souls. Jesus said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. We're all called to that. It's all our ministry. The Lord bless you.